Never like that. We say we talk when we talk about interpersonal impact as being little, we are reinforcing the idea that the things in this world that are big and worthwhile either make you money or make you famous. When we call them little, we're, I think if we evaluate things based on how much impact they have on other people as opposed to how much money they make or how much fame they generate, we start to realize the things that we dismiss as the little things, the kind words that we say, the moments when we try to recognize someone else's greatness, we realize it's the biggest thing we do. Simple doesn't mean little. I want to close today with the story that opened my eyes to that most significantly because when I went to school, leadership was something for a very few people. And what I wanted to do was beat everybody else so that I got to be one of those very few people. And that's and everything I did was geared to prove to someone I hadn't met yet that I was worthwhile, that I should be a leader one day. And then on my last day of my undergraduate university, this girl messed everything up for me. And she walks up to me at my farewell party and she says, Drew, I remember the first time I ever met you. And she told me a story from four years earlier. She said, four years ago was the night before I started university here. And I was in a hotel room with my mother and my father. And for whatever reason that night, I was just ripped with this intense feeling of self-death. Like I wasn't ready for this next stage in my life. And I was so convinced I was going to embarrass myself and the people who loved me that I started to cry. And my parents had seen me cry in eight years, but there was nowhere to hide in a hotel room. And my parents were amazing. They said, look, we know you're scared. Trust us, we're way more scared than you are. But you've worked so hard for this, you owe it to yourself to try, so here's the deal. We go to registration tomorrow. At any point during the day, if you feel you honestly can't do this, we will take you home and we love you no matter what. But, if you don't at least try tomorrow, we think you'll regret that the rest of your life, and our job as your parents is to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, we go, deal? And she goes, I knew they were right, because I never really provided uh, a concept of life that says you'll be successful if you don't go to college or university. I've never really presented that. So I got in line, and everybody was yelling on the first day. See, the problem about most orientation or welcoming activities is they're put together by extroverts who proceed to create a day that would be incredibly exciting for extroverts. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of people yelling. And she goes, which is great if you're an extrovert, it makes you excited. If you're an introvert, it can be terrifying. And I looked around on my first day and said, this is another place where only extroverts are valued. I will not spend four more years of my life in a place where you have to yell to fit in. And so standing in line on my first day, I decided to quit. And as soon as I made the decision to quit, I was overcome with this extraordinary feeling of peace. I knew it was the right decision. So I turned to my parents to say, take me home, like they said they would. And before I could say anything, you came out of the nearest building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen a man wear in my life. <laughs> I had toned down my hats in the last two decades, by the way. Like, this is conservative for me. She goes, you're walking down this lineup of first-year students and their parents who could not leave the lineup, by the way, with a giant sign that said, Shine Around the Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've now been involved with for almost two decades, but I was just starting as a volunteer then. And she goes, you had a giant bucket of lollipops. And what you were doing is you were walking along this lineup of people, and you were talking to them, you were trying to make them laugh, and you were trying to convince them to get up on Saturday morning and go shine shoes for charity. And all of a sudden you stopped, and you just stared at me. It was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> then you look at the guy next to me, and you smile, and you pull out this lollipop, and you hold it out to him, and you go, dude, you've got to give a lollipop to the incredibly beautiful woman you got to stand next to on your first day of school. Like, if you have to stand next to her for an hour, you got to talk to her, man. Break the ice, give her this lollipop. Give her the lollipop. She goes, I've never seen a dude before in my life, but I have never seen a human being get more embarrassed faster in my life. He won't even look at me, he just does this with the lollipop. <laughs> and I feel so bad for this guy who's turned me red that I take the lollipop from him. And as soon as I do, your entire demeanor changes. And you look so upset with me. And you turn to my parents and you go, look at your daughter. Look at your little girl. It is her first day away from home. Her first day without mom and dad to take care of her. And already she's taking candy from a stranger. <laughs> she goes, everybody loses it. Like 20 feet in every direction, everybody starts to laugh. And she goes, I don't know why, and I know this sounds cheesy, but in that moment when everyone was laughing, I changed my mind. And I decided, don't quit today. Quit tomorrow. <laughs> she goes, you know what I ever did? Like, I graduated a few weeks, and I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that happened. But I heard that you were leaving, and before that happened, I had to come up and tell you, you've been an incredibly important person in my life. And I'm really gonna miss you. And I wanted to make sure I wish you nothing but the best, okay? And thank you. 
And she walks off. Never drop a story like that on someone and they just walk away. <laughs> but she bails me out because she comes back. And she says, there's one more thing you should probably know. I've been dating that guy for four years since you introduced us that one. A year and a half after I moved a thousand miles away, the two of them invited me to their wedding. And she married the dude. Aww. Here's the thing. I don't remember that. <laughs> like, I have searched my memory for that moment because I was awesome in that moment. And I would like to remember being that awesome once in my life. But that was that's been such an eye-opener for me. It drives so much of the work that I do that maybe the biggest moment of leadership in my life, like maybe the biggest impact I ever had on another human being, a moment that had a girl walk up to a total stranger four years later and say, you have been an incredibly important part of my life. It's a moment that I don't even remember. And like we've been taught to spend so much time in our life trying to acquire things and achieve things that make people look at us like we're leaders that allow us to feel like we ourselves have the right to raise our hands as leaders, that I think we've lost sight of a fundamental fact. The primary determinant of how people view us, more importantly, how we view ourselves, is how we behave on a day-to-day -day basis and whether it is consistent with the values that we hold most dear. That's where it is. That's where leadership is born. And that is only our responsibility and nobody else's. Like, how many of you in this room have what I would refer to as a lollipop moment a moment where somebody has told you and made you feel that you matter, you did matter, or you will matter at some point in your life unexpectedly. How many of you have one of those moments of powerful interpersonal impact by show of 